Hello, everyone, and welcome back to AISC's live webinar series, Analysis and Design of Chevron Brace Connections with Flat Bar Gussets, presented by Patrick J. Fortney. Today is April 16, 2015, and Pat will be presenting Part 2 on Seismic Applications. My name is Brent Liu. I am with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope it's a valuable experience. Those of you that uh, participated in our pre-lecture polling questions, thank you. Hopefully you uh, found that of use, but uh, just trying. It, it works well when we have a two-part series to be able to do that. So hopefully you enjoyed that. So requirements for today. We're going to be in uh, listen-only mode. Uh, you've got the option of listening to that streamed audio through your computer or through the phone lines. And you've got both of those options throughout today's lecture. If you have any trouble with that streamed audio, you can always switch over to the phone lines. If you want to interact with today's speaker, simply type in your questions through the chat feature on the left-hand side of your screen, and we will address questions as time allows. I also want to ask you to resist the urge to use that raise hand feature. Just simply type in your questions and we'll see them on this end. And for legal reasons, I must announce that today's presentation is being recorded. As was the case last week, uh, today's lecture is approved uh, with AIA, the American Institute of Architects. And in conjunction with uh, being approved for continuing education with AIA, we need to let you know about the course description as well as the learning objectives. We won't go over these point by point right now, but we want to let you know that we do intend to fulfill these learning objectives today. And those are also found in your handouts, so you can study those further if you'd like. And speaking of handouts, just to let you know, everyone was given access to the handouts in advance of today's lecture, and uh, that link was found in your connection email. So we certainly encourage you to download the handouts for future reference and to follow along today. Last thing I want to go over is our CEU process. Within two days, you should be receiving an email with information on how to report your attendance. That email will be coming from registration at AISC.org. Uh, be on the lookout for this. We sent out the report, attendance reporting email last Friday for Part 1. So you should have received that by now, but you'll receive another one for reporting for Part 2. You have to report for both sessions separately, and you'll receive a certificate for each one of those. So that will have a URL in there for the reporting sites, and you'll use your AISC website credentials to access it. And we'll go over this again once more at the end of today's lecture. That does it for today's announcements. I want to welcome back our speaker, Patrick J. Fortney, PhD, PE, SE, and Professional Engineer. Dr. Fortney is the President of Surveys Engineering Corporation and the Chief Engineer for Surveys Steel Corporation, overseeing all engineering aspects performed by the seven Surveys Steel fabrication plants. Dr. Fortney is the co-recipient of the 2012 ASCE State of the Art of Civil Engineering Award. Among others, he is the Vice Chairman of the AISC Committee on Specifications. He's the Vice Chair of the AISC Seismic Design Manual Committee. He is a member of TC6, which is AISC's Committee on Steel Connections, and is also a member of RCSC Specification Committee and Council. Please welcome back Dr. Fortney. Pat, thanks for being here, and I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, thank you, Brent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we are going to talk about uh, Chevron brace connections using shaped single gussets today. Um, if you recall, last week we talked about uh, low seismic and wind applications. And so for part two, we're going to look at, uh, at seismic applications. Uh, what's in store for us today, I'll go through a couple slides here to uh, talk about the agenda. Uh, a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I will go over some items in regard to seismic versus non-seismic uh, uh, in regard to these types of connections. 
So there will be a brief explanation of what's different. Uh, we're going to look at some requirements for braced frames uh, in accordance with 341-2010. It will be specific to braced connection designs uh, relative to the V-type and inverted V-type configurations. Uh, we're going to look at the um, uh, OCBS a, a little bit. Uh, we'll look at the special concentrically braced frames mostly. And we'll talk about strength requirements and detailing requirements. We'll look at some of the requirements for the frame. Uh, we won't go into that into to great detail, only to the extent that it affects um, what we need to consider uh, when we're doing connection design. So we'll take a look uh, at uh, some, uh, some requirements in regard to gravity loads uh, and the braces, uh, the beam span, and then um, a mechanistic analysis or a mechanism analysis that's, uh, that's required in 34110. And then we'll finish up with an example problem. So a little bit of an introduction here. Um, uh, the information that was provided in part one relative to material grades, available widths and thicknesses, uh, suggestions on width increments and thickness increments, those apply equally to, uh, to, to today's topic. Uh, so please refer to the information that was presented during part one of the webinar. Uh, we won't be going over those again today. As far as the brace force distributions, if you recall last week we looked at some free body diagrams and talked about how to determine the uh, normal shear and moments that were acting on the interfaces. Uh, that's the same as uh, that was discussed in part one. What is different though is, are the brace forces that we'll be dealing with. 341 has specific connection strength requirements. Uh, AISC 341, by the way, just to, just to I guess to be um, to be uh, thorough, AISC 341 uh, is AISC's seismic provisions. Uh, we'll go into this in detail, but I do want to remind you that uh, we're going to go into this specifically in regard to V-type and inverted V-type configurations. Uh, we're not going to be going over um, all the requirements that you can find in 341. In regard to brace forces, most required strengths are given as expected yield and tensile capacities. Uh, I refer to them as sort of like member capacity design. And we'll take a look at what those brace force requirements are in regard to how you need to design the connection and how you evaluate the frame beam. All right, so I mentioned that these were given as expected yield and tensile strengths. So in the upcoming slides, we're going to see some equations that have these parameters R sub Y and R sub T. R sub Y is used as a correction factor to capture the expected material yield strength. And R sub T is used as a correction factor to capture the expected material tensile strength. Table A3.1 of AISC 341 provides uh, R Y and R T factors for various materials. And we'll look at that here in a, a slide or two. Before we look at that table, though, I want to point out um, I'm going to be doing some limit state checks on the brace itself, and I am going to be using an RY factor to, um, to calculate the available strength of the brace for some limit states. And this is uh, this, uh, this excerpt from A.3.2 of AISC 341 is where this comes from. And it has to do with material, material, uh, expected material strength. And it reads here, when required to determine the nominal strength, R sub n, for limit states within the same member from which the required strength is determined, the expected yield stress, Ry, Fy, and the expected tensile strength, Rt, Fu, are permitted to be used in lieu of Fy and Fu, respectively. Now, that's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so let me see if I can explain that uh, a little, uh, a little uh, differently. So let's put this in terms of a, a brace that's used in a seismic system framing to a gusset. When I, do, when I, when I have to determine for what that uh, connection needs to be designed for, the forces that the connection needs to be designed for, those are calculated based on the expected strength of the brace. So if I'm doing limit state checks on the brace itself, 
I can include the RY and RT factors when calculating the available strength provided by the brace because that's the, that's the member that was used to calculate the required strength. Hopefully that, um, that clears it up uh, as clear as mud. Um, if, it, if there's anybody that doesn't, uh, still not clear on that, um, I would invite you to send, uh, send Brent an email um, after, afterwards and uh, have him get with me and I will try to write something up for you and give you some example problems that explain that uh, uh, a, a little better. All right, so I referred to Table A3.1. This is an image uh, from, from that table in AISC 341. And what I have done here is I've blown up, um, I have blown up a couple of, um, couple of the items that we're going to be interested in today. So we're going to be looking at the uh, hollow structural sections. Uh, the RY factor for, for, for that section, for that material is 1.4. The RT factor is 1.3. And we're also going to be looking at some plate material. The RY factor for that is 1.1 1 .1 for the 572. And the RT is 1.2. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what's different uh, in today's topic relative to what we talked about last week. So in regard to connection geometry, it's similar to what we discussed uh, last week, uh, but with, uh, with, one, with one real important exception is that um, you're going to see that I'm, that I'm going to uh, pre present uh, um, a connection that accommodates brace buckling, and we do that through a hinge line. Uh, some people refer to it as a fold line. It's more commonly referred to as 2T. Uh, if you have other other ways of uh, describing that, that's fine. Uh, but uh, we're, we're looking at basically a hinge line that will allow the gusset to uh, to bend uh, unobstructed by um, unobstructed by the main members. And we're going to do this to accommodate brace buckling, and we'll look at it a little bit further. In regard to uh, the, uh, the connection strength uh, the, of the brace. Uh, these requirements are found in section F2.6C. Uh, for the brace and tension, the connection has to be good for RY, FYAG. Uh, we also look at two different uh, levels of compression, uh, the expected buckling strength and then the expected post-buckling strength. Uh, the buckling strength is defined as 1.14 F crit AG. And then in another part of the provisions, when we're looking at the connection design, we're required to increase, increase those compression uh, forces by a factor of 1.1. And then what, at the post-buckling strength, it's taken as 30% of its buckling strength. When you're calculating the buckling strength, uh, the buckling strength, it's important to, that you have an idea of what the uh, end of brace to end of brace length is. We need to take into it. We need to we need to use the end of brace to end of brace length as the length of the brace when we're calculating that buckling strength. Uh, just on a on a note here, uh, when you're in preliminary designs and you're trying to size your brace. It's okay to take that as work point to work point before you know what the connection geometry is. Uh, what that will do is um, decrease the, uh, the buckling strength, which will lead to a larger brace, which is a little bit conservative. But at the same time, because the, the connection design and the impact on the beam is based on the, on the expected strength of the brace, obviously the bigger the brace, uh, the larger the forces, the larger the impact on your connection and your frame. I referred to a hinge line earlier. Uh, this is a, an idealization of, of what that hinge line is. So basically what we want to do is we want to draw a line that would be perpendicular to the line of action of the brace and then offset that line by a dimension of two times the gusset thickness and then draw that line perpendicular to the line of action of the brace and that line should cross the free edges of the gusset. Uh, that would be a proper hinge line, and we do this in lieu of a flexural strength requirement. So the real requirement, the, the main requirement, is that the connection design uh, be designed 
to include the flexural strength of the brace about its critical buckling axis. An exception to that is that we, ac we accommodate brace buckling, and we do that through this hinge line. Right, so, and that is, used, that is the, the more typical way of doing this. So the exception to the rule is, is, is really the more common practice. We also have to check that section on this, uh, on this brace um, and, and the seismic provisions. The effective area of that net section has to be greater than equal to the, than the uh, gross area of the brace. And the yield strength, the FY of that reinforcing material has to be greater than or equal to the FY of the brace. When we're sizing the welds for the attachment of this reinforcing plate, that has to be done based on the expected strength of the reinforcing plate, and it has to be done on each side of the reduced section. Looking in the figure, you see I have this parameter X. X, is the, X in this figure here, it represents the slot in the brace beyond the edge of the gusset. Um, and I will suggest that you, you consider that dimension carefully in regard to erection. Uh, the, the slot needs to be large enough so that, the, so that the erector can get the brace into place. It's also important that, we, that you, know, you understand what that X dimension is going to be because that will drive the, the length of that reinforcing plate on your shop drawings and, 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 um, and how that's prepared and fabricated. And we want to make sure that, we, that we've got enough length overlap beyond that net section to get the required design weld on each side of that net section. There's also some requirements for protected zones in these uh, special concentrically braced frames. Uh, a protected zone is basically a zone where we are expecting a lot of inelastic deformations to occur in the material. And so what we want to do is avoid having welded attachments in these areas that would create hot spots or stress concentrations that would change the expected behavior. For a special concentrically braced frame, uh, the protected zones are the center one quarter of the brace. It's not shown in this figure. When we go through the example problem, uh, the, uh, we'll, we'll, that actually will show up in the figure. So we'll see that uh, in a sketch a little later on. Elements that to connect the braces uh, to, uh, to the beams and the, and the columns. So the gusset then is used to connect the brace to the beam. So the gusset is a protected zone. And then there's a zone adjacent to the connection that's equal to the brace depth in the plane of buckling. And based on the, the geometry of this connection, uh, this brace is being, this connection is designed such that the brace buckles out of plane. Uh, that brace dimension out of plane is B, and so we would have to, that protected zone would extend a distance B out from the connection. For ordinary concentrically braced frames in regard to, to, to beam analysis, you can find this in section F1.4A. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and it states that the required strength shall be determined, assuming that the braces provide no support of dead and live loads. So in other words, you cannot let your braces carry gravity load in the, in the, deter in the evaluation of your, of your frame beams. The seismic load effect E, uh, E is the parameter that you find in the load combinations in Chapter 2 of ASCE 7. Uh, they're determined as follows. The, the forces and the braces in tension are going to be assumed to be the least of the following. One is the expected tensile strength of the brace, RYFYAG. The other is the load effect based upon the amplified seismic load. I have omega naught here in parentheses. Basically what this is, is you take the results from your linear elastic analysis, and then you take them into the equations given in Chapter 12.4 of ASC 7, seismic load combinations with overstrain, or then the maximum force that can be developed by the system. Um, so what we're going to concentrate on today is, is A, the expected tensile strength of the brace. Uh, we won't really talk about uh, uh, options B or C here.
For braces and compression, they're assumed to be equal to 30% of what the, what, that, uh, what the compression strength is. And there's really two different analyses that have to be performed. Um, I have these two here in uh, single parentheses because this is really a paraphrase. This is, this is not a direct quote for 341. It's just a paraphrase. So the first low case with, in regard to your tension brace is going to be RY, FY, AG. And then your compression brace is going to, the force in that is going to be equal to its expected buckling strength. The second low case would be that the tension brace is uh, going to be equal to its expected tensile strength, RY, FY, AG. And then the compression brace is going to be taken as the post buckling strength, which is 30% of its expected buckling strength. In the example problem, we'll look at uh, we'll look at evaluating these two load cases. Also, note that now we're talking about the demand on the columns and the beams and basically the frame. There is no, there is not a 1.1 factor on here. So, for the analysis in regard to the main members, the compression strengths are not multiplied times 1.1, as I showed for the for the, what was required for the strength of the connection. This is what's referred to in the agenda. I refer to a mechanistic analysis. It's these two load cases here that I'm referring to. And so if we look at sort of a representative uh, frame here, so if you'll notice on this, on this left figure here, I have the tension braces here at R, R Y F Y A G, and the compression braces are loaded at its, at its expected tensile strength, so that would, or expected compression strength. So that would be one load case that we'd have to chase through the frame. The second load case would be the same for the tension brace, the expected tensile strength. But then we'd look at the braces uh, in a compression of its, at its post buckling strength. And these two results pre present uh, different, uh, uh, different governing states depending on what you're looking at. So you have to evaluate both of these load cases. For special concentrically braced frames, if we're talking about these V and inverted V type braces, you look at section F2.4B, it states that the beam, when beams are intersected by braces away from the beam, the column connections. Uh, so what that is, is if you recall uh, last week when we went through the introduction, I talked about what I call a two-story X brace. Uh, this would be that intermediate level. Uh, where, where the, we have a, a, a V-type configuration on top of the beam and an inverted V-type configuration on the bottom. The beams have to be continuous be between the columns. I have had people suggest to me uh, that um, to get rid of the chevron effect, uh, that, we, um, that we make the braces continuous and break the beam up and, uh, so that the, um, the braces are continuous. Uh, that's not permitted in AISC 341. All right, so in other words, they, they, they cannot be discontinuous through that brace beam work point. The beams cannot. CF 4.B or F4B for other requirements that aren't specific to this webinar, there's, a, there's, there's several more pieces of requirements in F2.4B uh, that I did not mention here uh, because they're not relative to the conversation. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at designing a um, special concentrically braced frame using a uh, chevron configuration, make sure that you're familiar with, um, with that chapter, chapter F of, the, um, of AISC 341. All right, so that's a brief introduction into what we're doing here. Um, let's get into an example problem. Uh, in this example problem, I am going to be using a shaped gusset. Uh, in this figure here, I'm showing a flat bar, um, but for the, and, and there's no reason why you can't use a flat bar gusset in a seismic application. Uh, if you can make it work and the plate thicknesses and sizes and your welds are, are you, you find to be economical, that's fine. Uh, from my experience, I've found that you typically need to shape those uh, to increase that, uh, that interface length. Uh, to increase your, your buckling area and things like that so that you, you can make these plate thicknesses and wells more economical. All right, so we're going to look at a frame similar to the example problem that we went through last week. 
Um, the one thing that I will point out is that the, the brace sizes have decreased a little bit, right? And so um, we're looking at the at these marker ones or HSS four by four by three eighths, marker twos or HSS five by five by three eighths. So we're going to take as a given here that this frame's been analyzed and designed as a special concentrically braced frame in accordance with uh, the requirements in AISC 34110. Uh, however, we're still in a preliminary stage here, and the beam has not yet been evaluated for the effects of this mechanistic analysis. So what we're going to do is we're going to make all the appropriate limit state checks to verify that the connections that uh, we'll show in, a, in the next couple of slides meet the requirements of AISC 34110. And similar to what I said last week, um, I would have loved to have done a design example problem for you to sort of demonstrate what happens when you go down the road and find out that you made a, you made a decision that doesn't work and then you've got to backtrack. Uh, but given the uh, limited amount of time that we have for these webinars, uh, what I did is I designed the connection, and we're just going to walk through uh, checking all the appropriate limit states. So in addition to designing the connection, we are then going to evaluate the beam uh, for the tension compression load case. And we'll look at a slide uh, in a little bit here that demonstrates what I mean by the tension compression loop case. Again, so we're designing this connection here at level two, uh, the one in the circled in red. This is the connection that, uh, that uh, we're, we're going to make the checks on. So we want to make all the appropriate limit state checks for that. And then we're going to evaluate the beam uh, looking at mechanistic analysis. And that mechanistic analysis load case is just going to be one of the two uh, and considering only one direction. In practice, you'd have to look at both load cases, meaning uh, expected tensile, expected buckling, and then expected tensile and expected post buckling, and then for loads in both directions. Uh, for, uh, uh, for, and um, in observance of the limited time here, we're just going to look at the expected tensile strength expected post buckling strength for the TC case where the left braces are in tension and the right braces are in compression. And then you just use the same procedure that I'm going to, that we'll show uh, how to do that. And you use that same procedure for the other, for the other checks. All right, so we're given that the, the HSS shapes are grade A500B. Uh, we're using Y-flange shapes, 99250. Our plate material and flat bar material is going to be 57250. And then going to part one of the manual, we can go and get these uh, uh, material and uh, geometric um, uh, values and parameters that are used for design. Again, just as a reminder, I know that the I know that the figures in the in the leading slides. I try to at least show the figure on all the calculation slides so that you have something to refer to, but they get a little small. So here's just a, a blow up of, um, of of all the information regarding the design of the connection. So before we can start designing, we need to um, we need to determine for what strengths these uh, these um, Brace, these brace connections need to be designed for. So we're looking at the design of the connection now. We are not looking at the impact on the beam. We'll look at that later. So the expected tension strength of the brace is RY, FYAG, as we've discussed. RY for 500B is 1.4. We looked at that as a FY of 46. The cross-sectional area is 6.18 square inches. That gives us an expected tensional strength of 398 kips. To get that force into its components, uh, brace one has a, has a rise of nine and uh, seven eighths over twelve. So we have an angle off of the horizontal of 39.5 degrees, and that gives us horizontal and vertical components of 307 and 253 kips, respectively. If you recall from part one, the moment at A is H1 E sub B minus V1 times L1 minus delta, delta 1. Uh, plugging with these, with these values here, we get a moment 
acting on A of 521 kip inches. And we'll see the free body diagrams of these forces a little later on. In regard to its expected buckling strength, what we're going to do is we don't know what the connection looks like on the bottom end of these braces, so we're going to assume a 36 inch pull off at the opposite end of the brace. The work point to work point length of that brace is uh, the square root of 17 squared plus 14 squared. It's 22 feet long, work point to work point. And so the end of brace to end of brace length, L1, uh, is given as 22 times 12 uh, minus these values. So I'm subtracting out uh, the, the dimension from the work point to where the line of action of the brace crosses the flange, and then that pull off dimension of 11.625. I'm subtracting out the 36 inch pull off at the other end. That gives me a uh, end of brace to end of brace length of 197 inches. As is typical, the KL over R value, we're using 1.0 for K. Uh, the R, for the radius of gyration for this brace is 1.87. That gives us a KL over R of 105. Uh, we compare that to the 4.71 that we talked about these limit states last week. Of 118, that's greater than 105, and so we would use this equation to calculate um, to calculate the um, uh, the critical stress. To do that, we need to calculate the uh, the Euler Euler strength, it's pi squared, 29,000 over KL over R squared. That gives us 25.9. Now, when we're talking, when we're calculating the critical stress. We have to replace, remember this is the expected compression strength. So wherever Fy occurs, we have to include the Ry factor. So that's why this 1.4 is here and the 1.4 is there. That is the correction factor to get it to the expected strength. So we plug these values into this equation. We did a very similar calculation last week. Uh, the main difference here is that we're including the RY factor, and we get 22.7. I'll also point out um, that, you know, be careful. Um, I have to be honest, I have done this myself. As I've gotten to, uh, what I've calculated my FE and my KL over R, and then I, and then I go to, I go to part table 422, and I pull out that, uh, I pull out that critical stress value out of the table. Um, uh, don't do that because those values do not include the RY factors. Because we're talking about connection design forces, we need to increase these buckling strengths by 1.1. So 1.1 times my expected buckling strength is 176 kips. I get the uh, components of those forces. It's 136 and 112 kips respectively. If you recall, um, we're, we have a moment of now, if, if you recall from last week, uh, when a brace is in compression, the components of the, for, of the brace forces are taken as negative, and that's why we have the negative signs plugged in here on this calculation. And so I get a moment at A, that is the moment that's acting at this interface here, equal to 232 kip inches minus. For the expected post buckling strength, it's just 30% of the buckling strength. So I just multiply that 176 times uh, 0.3, and I get 52.8 kips. Again, I want to calculate the uh, the components of that of those forces, and then calculate the moment acting at that interface. Again, this brace is in compression, so I'm going to um, use negative values for these component forces and I get a moment MA equal to minus 68.3 kip inches. All right, so we know the forces that we're, that we're designing for here. Um, so we're looking at brace one, that is this left brace here, and we want to design the brace to gusset weld, or check it anyway because the design's been done. And if we look at that brace, the gusset weld, we'll see that it's 18 inches long. Uh, the uh, connection length is 1 foot 6 inches. And so we'll use this equation that we used last week. It's 1.392 times the, times the weld size times the length. 
and I have this little uh, lowercase n here to represent the number of welds. There's four welds that are 18 inches long, uh, and it is a uh, quarter inch weld. It gives me a strength of 401 kips. It's greater than 398, and so we're okay there. One of the things that I will point out here is that my typical procedure is that I check buckling when I'm putting my trial geometry together. In this particular case, it was actually the tension load that, uh, that drove the size of the brace, or drove the size of the gusset. I also need to check shear rupture of the brace walls, and shear rupture where this, uh, where this tube is slotted over the gusset. Uh, we talked about that last week. Um, there are four welds. Uh, they are L sub W long, and we're going to use the design thickness of the, of the walls. Um, so plugging and chugging here, this 1.3 is the RT factor. And remember now we're doing a, we're checking the available strength of the brace. The brace was what was used to calculate the required strength, and so I can increase its, its available strength by the RT factor. Uh, the design wall thickness is 0.349 square inches uh, or inches. That gives me a design strength of 853 that's greater than our 398, and so we're good for rupture at the brace walls. We need to check gusset buckling. Uh, the, uh, the unbraced length here is taken as the, as the length along the line of action of the brace from where it crosses the flange at the end of the brace. It's 11 and 5 eighths inches. As we discussed last week, we use a K factor of 0.7 for this. Uh, the simplified version for a rectangle for the radius of gyration is its thickness divided by the square root of 12. We have a KL over R of 37.6. Right, so this is, this is the gusset now. Uh, we're, not, we're not including an RY factor, so I can go to table 4-22, and I get that BF crit is 40.5. And again, while we're here, I'll remind you um, the C factors are already embedded into the values tabulated in Table 422. Uh, so don't double dip on your fee factor. It's already included in the value. I can use a little bit of Whitmore here. This is not a flat bar. It's a shaped gusset. And so I, I do have a little bit more width that I can work with to, to get that width more width here at the end of the brace. Uh, that is calculated uh, given this equation. We went over this last week. So I have a width more width along the gusset at the end of the brace equal to 11.9 inches. I have a CF crit of 40, 40.5. My gusset is 3 quarters of an inch thick. That gives me a buckling strength of 361 kips. I'm going to compare that. This is a buckling check now, so I'm going to compare it to the larger of the buckling loads that I need to check against. So that's 176. Checking tensile yield on the gusset. It's just 0.9 FY times the uh, cross-sectional area. I get a strength of 402 kips. Uh, that's greater than the 398, and so we're good for tension yield. I need to check net section rupture. Uh, so this is a little bit different uh, than what we did last week uh, because there's, there's now a plate on this. So we don't just have the, uh, the HSS shape. You remember case 6 of table uh, D3.1 of the specification uh, gives you an equation for calculating X bar. Um, you can't use that because we, uh, we've added to the geometry here, so we have to calculate X bar. I'll also remind you that when we calculate the effective area, I'm going to multiply 2 times that, the area of that reinforcement because although not shown in this figure, uh, there is a reinforcing plate on, on uh, the, the opposite faces of the brace. I'm simplifying the calculation of X bar here using the rectangles. I don't want to get too complicated trying to take into consideration the, uh, the radii on these members. And so I've provided a figure here that gives uh, all of our, all of our, um, our, our D, D values or y, y prime values, if you will. And so just plugging and chugging, this is the, the uh, summation of AY, AY for the reinforcing plate. 
This is the summation of AIYI for the horizontal section of the brace, and this is the summation of AIYI for the two vertical legs. I get an X bar of 1.64 inches, and so plug that into my U, which is defined as 1 minus X bar over L. If you recall from the figure, that connection length is 18 inches, and so I get a shear lag factor of 0.909. Now I need to make sure that my effective area is greater than the gross area of the, um, uh, of the brace. And so I'm going to calculate the net area of the brace. It's the gross area uh, minus 2 times 0 0.375. 375 is the nominal width of the wall. This is a, this is a 5 by 5 by 3 eighths. And we discussed last week why I use that value and not the design value. And then I have a break, uh, the gusset plate is three quarters of an inch thick. I add an eighth of that. I add an eighth of that to account for to uh, make ease of the uh, brace sliding over the gusset. That gives me a brace area, net area, 5.52 square inches. Each reinforcing plate is two and a quarter by three eighths. I have two of those plates. And so if I sum up those two areas, account for my shear lag, which we calculated. That gives me an effective area of 6.55 inches squared, which is greater than the gross area of the brace, so we're good there. I also note, I don't have this shown on the slide, uh, but the, the plate material that we're using for this is grade 50, which is greater than the 46 KSI FY for the brace, so we also satisfy that requirement of 341. All right, so we now need to we need to attach this reinforcing plate to the um, to the brace, and if you recall, F two point five B requires you to size that weld based on the expected strength of the plate. This is five seventy two material we're using, so the R Y factor is one point one. It's fifty ksi material. The cross sectional area is uh, it's a two and a quarter by three eighths plate, so that's fifty six point four. I have two welds. We're using a quarter inch weld, uh, and um, uh, so I get 55.6 kips. That's greater than 46.4, so we're okay. I am going to jump back one slide here real quick. Uh, I forgot to make a point. One of the things that uh, that you want to be you want to be uh, you want to ensure is you want to go and check and make sure what the what the workable flat on these HSS shapes are. To make sure that you have room for the, for the plate to sit flushly on the wall, and also so that you have enough flat left to be able to make the weld on both sides. So make sure that you take that in, in consideration when when you do that. Pat, yes, sir. Before you you move on, there's another question on this slide. Um, can you clarify or maybe repeat uh, when calculating a sub n? Um, why are we adding uh, the additional one eighth inch shown here? Okay, so we're we're making a slot in the tube. So this is this is actually the width of the slot. This 0.75 plus 1.25 is the width of the slot. Um, the gusset is three quarters of an inch thick, and so we need to slide that we need to slide that uh, that slotted slotted brace over the gusset. Um, if we make that slot three quarters inch and we got a three quarter inch plate, if this thing is over rolled a little bit or the slot is undercut a little bit, the erector is just going to have a heck of a time getting that thing over, uh, getting it over the gusset. So we increase the width of the slot by an eighth of an inch uh, to allow for that. And ideally, what will happen then is, is when the attachment of the brace to the gusset occurs, They'll center the gusset in that slot, and you'll have a 16th inch gap on each side of the brace. That's that's ideally, um, but the the 1 8 inch is to accommodate erection and to allow the brace to to, to easily slide over the gusset. Okay, and then um, one other question in terms of the gusset plate. I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, the question is, 
is there a recommended length or recommended maximum length of a free edge for that gusset plate? Uh, there is not. Um, so especially on something like this, and in fact, um, uh, in the 2005 version um, of the uh, seismic design manual, there was some discussion and an example problem on how to calculate the buckling on the free edge. Um, um, that, that has been withdrawn in the 2010 specifications. Uh, although I will, I will point this out. So my, my, I, I would say no. Um, it's really a non-issue with these types of braces. It's so easy uh, to, to to get this 2T dimension and keep this con connection compact that that free edge length is 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 usually you know, insignificantly longer uh, than the um, than the le the unbraced length along the work point. But if someone is interested in that, if you have a, I would say, a, a, a uncommonly shaped gusset that you would be worried about that, uh, in one of the appendices of the new seismic or the new uh, vertical brace um, design guide, and I think it's Appendix C, but don't quote me. But one of the appendices uh, talks about how to evaluate the uh, free edge buckling if you're interested in doing that. Okay, thanks, Pat. Do you remember where we were? I want to say. I did that. Sorry, guys. Uh, give me a minute. I, let me regroup. I think this is where we need to be now. Okay. Right. We finished with we finished with um, with attaching the reinforcing plate, and so we met, we we're continuing here. All right. And so now we need to do some checks on section A. Section A is the interface between the gusset, the left gusset, and the uh, and the beam. And if you recall from last week, we referred to that as section A. We need to check gross shear. Um, these are this is the free body diagram of those forces that we calculated. Uh, on the left side here, we're looking at tension 398 because that would cause the, the the largest loads on this interface for checking the checking this interface. And so we have 307 kips of shear, 253 kips of normal force, and we have a moment of 521 kip inches. So checking shear yield on section A. It's phi times 0.6 times Fy times X1, which is the which is the interface length, times the thickness of the gusset. If you recall from the diagram, our interface length was 24 and 5 eighths. The gusset is three quarters of an inch thick. That gives us a shear capacity of 554 kips. That's greater than three, the 307 kips, which is the shear, and so we're okay for shear. In regard to shear rupture, uh, remember we have a dip, we we're now dealing with Fu with a different phi factor. I like to show these two checks regardless of the material strength. I understand that depending on material strengths, one could go for another other, but I like to show both of them. In this case, it's actually the rupture that governs. Uh, the 0.75 times the 65 uh, turns out to be smaller than the 1 times the 50. And so we get 540 kips. That's greater than the 307. And so we're okay. Looking at tension yielding, we have a tension force of 253 kips. That's 0.9 times Fy times the cross-sectional area at section A. 24 and 5 eighths interface length. It's three quarters. It gives us an available strength that's 831 kips, greater than the required of 253, so we're okay for that. We need to check bending on section A. Um, this is a check that we did not do last week uh, because last week we used flat bars, and so the line of action of the brace uh, where it crosses the flange coincided with the centroid of that interface, so we didn't have a moment. We have a moment here with this shaped gusset. Again, and I will point out here before I get into this, I'm sorry, I, I go on a size here every once in a while. Um, 
because I'm using a shaped gusset, I have a moment. Now that doesn't mean that you have to have a moment on this interface with a shaped gusset. If you want to take the time to shape that gusset uh, such that the interface of the, of the gusset interface coincides with where the line of action of the brace crosses the flange, have at it. That's great. I didn't do that purposefully here in this example problem because I wanted, to, I wanted to have that moment there just to demonstrate how to handle it. All right, and so we're going to do this based on the, its plastic strength. Uh, Vmn is 0.9 times Fy times Z. A Z in this case, it's a rectangle, so it's the thickness times the interface length squared over 4. It's 4, so we're using plastic. If we were using S here, that denominator would be 6. That gives us a, an available moment strength of 5,100 kip inches. Uh, greater than our 521, so we're okay for bending. We need to attach that gusset uh, with this uh, to, with a weld, and so we need to we need to check that gusset to being weld. Um, again, I'm summarizing what the what the forces and moments are here. Because of this moment, we are going to calculate an equivalent normal force. Uh, the normal force due to the component of the brace is 253. Uh, that's the 253 in this calculation. Uh, this is 4m over L. We discussed 4m over L last week. Um, that is basically it's two times the couple that would be associated with this moment. Uh, the couple is 2m over L. We're going to multiply that times 2. Again, uh, in uh, appendix, I believe it's B of the design guide uh, 29, uh, there's a nice little figure that talks about that 4M over L. So I sum up the, uh, I sum up the equivalent uh, normal force from my moment plus the, the vertical component of the brace force. It gives me a total normal force of 338 kips. My resultant force then is the square root of the sum of the squares of the total normal force and the shear. That gives me a resultant of 457 kips. The angle for, uh, from the longitudinal axis of the brace uh, to the line of action of that resultant force is the arc tangent of the normal force over the uh, shear. It gives me 47.8. And so my directional strength increase then is 1.32. So I can calculate the strength of the, that weld now. It's 1.392. I have two welds. They are 7 16 inch uh, welds. The interface length is 24.625. I have a directional strength increase of 1.32. And we talked about the ductility factor last week. We're using a ductility factor of 1.25. That gives us a strength of 507 kips. We need 457, so we're okay in regards to the weld. All right, so we are, that takes us now to uh, brace two. And so if you don't mind, um, what I'm going to do here is I am going to skip to where we're to the evaluation of the beam uh, to make sure that we get through that. And then if there's enough time, then we'll come back to, uh, to and look at the calculations for brace two, uh, but there, it's basically just a repeat with the with the correct uh, with the correct values substitute, substituted in for, for brace two. And while I'm looking for this, uh, Brent, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but while I'm looking for this, if you've got a question that could be answered right now, I'm glad to do that. Yeah, you've got we um, you've got a couple questions here, so. Let's go to slide, uh, you're going to go to 77. So I'm going to go back to slide 57. Okay. And the first question we have on these, these calculations you've been going through is um, when calculating your moment, instead of using 24.65 for the brace height, why not use the shorter perpendicular distance? 
Well, the, the moment that we're looking at is, is the, the moments being transferred uh, from the gusset uh, to the weld, if you will, uh, and um, uh, along that length. Uh, so, the, so the bending strength uh, where that moment is being transferred is over that, over that, that section of the plate. And so I, I'm using 24.625 because that's the that is the actual um, actual section that's being used to transfer the moment. It would be um, really conservative uh, to to use any other any other length there. Okay, and then the next question, still on this slide here, uh, does the gusset bending need to be checked with axial load? Does the gusset bending need to be checked with axial load? Um, and, so what, and, I, and I'm assuming that that question is, is should there be a bending axial load interaction check? Um, I, b I believe that's the question. Um, and I would I would say I would say no. Um, you could do that check if you wanted, but for this particular application, I would say that that check is unnecessary. Okay. All right. Let's all move us back up to seventy-seven. Yeah. Let's let's go to the detailing thing here. Yeah. Before I get into the beam. Uh, before I get into the beam. So. Um, so when we went over brace the brace one calculations, that was all strength stuff. And in seismic design, in 341, there are provisions depending on the, uh, on the uh, type of system you're using. Uh, there's strength requirements, but there's also detailing requirements to, to, um, to ensure uh, the ductility uh, that you're going to get justifying that R factor that you used. So I wanted to make sure that I covered the detailing. I mentioned that we were going to accommodate brace buckling. Uh, by providing this hinge line. And so let's check that. Um, at brace 1 here, um, I provided the dimensions here uh, for brace 1 and brace 2. Uh, my, required, uh, my required distance here would be 2 times the thickness of the gusset. It's a 3 quarter inch gusset on, uh, on brace 1. So I would need this distance to be 1.5 inches. I've got 3 and 3 quarters, so I'm, I'm clearly good there. Brace two, I have 300. I have three and seven sixteenths inches. Uh, it's a seven eighths gusset here, and so it's two times seven eighths, 1.75. I've actually got about 3.4 inches here, so I'm larger than the 1.75. So I'm good in regard to uh, providing that that uh, that hinge line. And so it sort of begs the question. Um, uh, you know, someone could ask, well. Go back here. If you, if you only need one and a half inches, why are you providing 3.75? Well, I'm going to tell you, I did not. It was not my goal to provide 3.75. It was not my goal to provide 3.4 here on brace two, but it was my goal uh, to make sure that I had something a little larger than 2t. And so uh, I, I will make this statement that I think we need to look at the 2t. As, as, it, as it being really a minimum clearance. And you really don't want anything less than 2T. And in fact, I, I believe the, um, the old Astani stuff um, was really was talking about uh, 3T, uh, 4T, uh, and made a recommendation of 2T men. And so I like to think of 2T as, as a minimum clearance, uh, and I like to provide a little bit more than that to allow for any fabrication and erection tolerances. So I think it's a good idea to provide a pull-off that's going to allow for those tolerances. Now, it doesn't have to be as large as the, as the allowance that I've provided here with this particular uh, geometry, but just keep that in mind when you're doing that. Um, it, it may be problematic if you're doing this right down to a really sharp pencil, and the detailer is using a really sharp pencil. And then you wind up getting something a little less than 2T. So just some food for thought. Uh, we also need to provide some protected zones. Um, as we went through before, um, uh, we went through what they actually are. This is sort of a diagram, again, of a connection that we're looking at. 
Um, so we have, uh, we have to make sure that we're looking at the elements that connect the braces to the beams and columns. So it's our gusset plate. It's the center one quarter of the brace length. And so this intersection here is a, is a protected zone. And then zones adjacent to each connection equal to the brace depth in the plane of the buckling. Uh, this brace with this gusset, with this connection configuration, the brace buckles out of plane. And so we're looking at the B dimension. Just as, a, as an aside here, it doesn't really have anything to do with the engineering, um, but when, you're, when we're, you're dealing with seismic systems, and I'll make this statement not just, for these, not just for this type of connection, but for all connections and members and seismic applications. Uh, we need to make sure that we, uh, we clearly identify these protected zones on the structural drawings. Any engineering sketches that are prepared by the connection designer whether it's the engineer of record designing those connections or it's the uh, or a delegated connection designer. They need to be shown on the shop drawings and they need to be shown on the erection drawings. Okay. Let's take a look at the beam loading. Um, we are going to um, we are going to um, do the T C case where the tension brace is um, is at its expected tensile strength. And the compression brace is at its post buckling. Um, I have missed a 0.3 factor on this um, because it, we're at post buckling. We should multiply that times 0.3. I've made a note of that on, th on this slide, on the next slide. So on slide 81 and slide 80, if you could uh, write in that 0.3 there for you because we're talking about post buckling. My apologies if that causes any, um, any confusion for you. Okay, so what we're, we've already calculated these, these two levels of force, but we did that in regard to connection design. And so the compression load that we're going to look at, we're going to take and divide those by 1.1 because there is no increase in that, in that force when we're doing this analysis of the beam. All right, again, as a reminder, our expected tensile strength is 398. And here are our horizontal, component, the horizontal and vertical components of that tension force. The moment that we have is 521 kip inches. For the brace and compression, we're at the expected post buckling strength. We're going to take those, uh, those values that we calculated for connection design and divide them by 1.1. And so now here are our horizontal and vertical components. And then using these components, we're going to calculate the moment acting on section B. It's 54.6 kip inches. Also, I'll remind you again uh, with, the, with the convention that we use to derive these equations, because the brace is in compression, uh, the components here are negative. All right, so that gives us an expected post buckling strength of 64.4 kips. And so these are the resultant loads that are acting on acting on the section. And note that I have these I have these resultant forces acting uh, at the centroid of the interfaces. And we were it was given in the problem statement that we're going to include the gravity load uh, when we look at the effect on the beam. All right, so I'll come back a slide again here. So we will use these resultant forces, uh, specifically these normal forces, when we do our web yielding uh, or web crippling checks. But when we're looking at the shear and bending distribution along the length of the beam, we want to use resultant forces and moments because um, it's, it's very it, it can be, it may be conservative. To use, to use the resultant loads uh, from the hundreds of these things that I've looked at. It's typically, more, it's, it's typically really conservative in regard to moment or bending demand on the beam, and not so much in regard to shear, um, but it's, it's conservative either way. And so what I've done is I've taken those distributed loads and I've simplified them to the net loads. 
and this is what the, how, how our beam is loaded. So outside of the connection regions, we have the gravity load of 1.8 kits per foot. Over X1 or the interface for brace 1, we have 125 kit feet acting downward. Over the interface of brace 2, we have 27.2 kits per foot acting upward. Um, just, to be, just to be thorough, I got this uh, 1.8 kits per foot that's acting over that little half inch in between the interfaces. And then these are the resultants of the two moments. There's two moments acting here. One of the moments is the horizontal force or the, or the shear force acting on the flange of the beam times E sub B. And then the additional moment is the moment that we have at the interface due to the connection geometry. And these are the resultant loads here. And so I'm going to evaluate this beam uh, as if it's simply supported, honoring the boundary conditions that are typically assumed for a braced frame, idealized as pin connected members. Can generate the shear and moment diagrams based on this now, and I find that I have a maximum required shear of 168 kips. I have a maximum required moment of 1,700 kip feet. Both the maximum shear and the maximum moment occur within the connection region. So I want to check the beam limit states, bending, and shear. Um, the beam is good, for, has an available strength of 840 kit feet, uh, significantly less than uh, what's required. Okay, re recall that this is a mechanistic analysis, and it was said in the problem statement that we, that, uh, that we are still in preliminary stages of design for the frame, and so um, we, have, we, we still needed to do this mechanistic analysis. And this is this is what uh, this is what we're finding. Uh, the 24 by 84 that's currently being used has a has a available shear strength of 340 kips. Uh, we only need 168, so we're good for shear. Uh, we're not good for moment. Uh, before we go on to um, to the moment, though, we need to size the beam uh, to satisfy that bending requirement. But before we do. Let's go ahead and check. Um, let's go ahead and check the um, the um, other limit states on the beam. So we need to look at web yielding. Uh, we talked about this equation last week. We had a force of 253 kips. Uh, that is, uh, we get a design strength of 422 kips, and so we're good for the limit state of web local yielding. In regard to web local crippling, uh, this, is, this is a check that we do when we have a concentrated force acting in compression on one side of the member. Uh, the compression force is 47.2. Uh, so we plug and chug on this and we get 340 kips of strength. Only 47.2, we're good. And again, I guess to be thorough, I'll remind you uh, this 0.8 coefficient here. Um, I, think it's, I think it's safe to assume uh, that these types of connections are, are, are going to be sufficiently away from the, from the beam or from the end of the beam relative to the depth uh, that we can use this equation. If you've got some weird configuration uh, where this force is acting um, within that D over 2 region, uh, then you'll have, to, you'll have to go to chapter J and, and use the correct equation. Uh, that was discussed in part one of the presentation. All right, uh, let's go back to bending. All right, so we need a, we need uh, 1,700 kip feet a moment. Uh, we're only good for 840, and so we need a plastic section modulus that's greater than or equal to the 462 inches cube. All right, uh, to to resist that design moment. So if we go to uh, the manual and, and find a, a member that has that, a 24 by 176 has a plastic section modulus of 511 inches cubed. That's greater than the 462 that we need. Um, so we can use a 24 by 176. However, uh, we did change the geometry of the connection slightly. 
with the 24 by 84, um, it was uh, what 24.1 inches deep. This 24 by 176 is 25.2 inches deep. It's 1.1 inches deeper than what our connection design was done for. Uh, this gives an increase in E sub B of about 0.55 inches. Uh, so this would create a create a, a modest change in your force distribution uh, and your pull off, uh, and then uh, obviously in your beam shear and moment. And so you really need need to go back with an iteration and check this again. Um, but given given the that's why I, I chose a 24. I tried to stay with the same depth uh, so that I, I wasn't changing the geometry of the connection drastically. And so if you went back with this, with this modest increase in E sub B, uh, given that we're at 511 and E462, I think you would find that the, the 24 by 176 uh, would, would be fine. And so if we look at the, at, at the result here, then if we take a look, go back to our, our moment diagram, we're not going to look at the shear, um, same depth, thicker web. Uh, so we know that we're, we're, we're more than good now for, for shear uh, and uh, web crippling and, and web yielding. We just need to look at the moment now. With the 24 by 176, it's good for 1920 kip feet. We only need 1732. Uh, so we're going to select the 24 by 176. All right. With that being done, then we have um, we've come to the end. There's uh, technically I have about uh, what about three minutes left. Certainly not enough time to go back and look at the calculations for the connection on brace two. Um, but I think uh, covering what we did in brace one uh, does that. Uh, sufficiently. So I am going to say thank you for your time. I appreciate you joining in and turn it over to Brent to see if we've got any questions or anything else that we have to um, that we want to talk about. Okay, thank you, Pat. Um, the first question, uh, can we go to slide 79, please? We had, a, we had a couple questions in regards to protected zones. Okay. Uh, so the first question is, uh, can you can you expand on the significance of the 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 protected zones? Why we have those? Yes. All right. So we when we have systems where we ex uh, I'll back up a little bit. Um, if you look in through the provisions at the beginning of each system chapter, there's a little description in there about the, about the scope and its and its and the system analysis, and it describes whether or not um, we expect this the system to accommodate uh, minimal inelastic deformations or large inelastic deformation, and then it goes on to identify the members that are assumed to, um, to go through those inelastic deformations. So when we have systems that are expected to experience significant inelastic deformations, um, which is in special systems, then we want to protect the material that is be, that's going to be going through that uh, significant inelastic deformation. And so we won't <coughs> we don't want to uh, do any weld, make any weld attachments or shoot headed studs on the things, or weld erection aids uh, in areas because that welding creates uh, heat affected zones, uh, creates redistribution, redistribution and stresses, potential hot spots um, where it may jeopardize or degrade the ability of that material to accommodate that inelastic deformation. Okay. So the materials Expecting to do that, that's why we call them protected zones. Okay, and then a related question then is: Are connections to the brace acceptable outside the protected regions? Wow. Well, um, that's uh, at, in re, in regard to. Uh, <laughs> Protected zones, uh, yeah, sure. Um, 
but let's let's think about the let's think about what um, what's happening here, uh, in a, in a, especially in a special concentrically braced frame. Um, we're wanting these braces to do a lot of work. Uh, in, in fact, them buckling and going through um, large rotations and buckling uh, is a very desirable behavior. Uh, so we would want not to do anything that would jeopardize the performance of the system. So let's be careful about what we're going to attach to these braces outside of the protected zone. Uh, but technically, if you wanted to weld something onto the brace outside of the protected zone, there's nothing in 341 that would stop you from doing that. Okay. Next question. Should you check the beam web panel zone shear? Oh yeah, this uh, this question came up last week. All right, and so uh, yeah, this question came up last week, and uh, and my answer to that was I think I said something along the lines of uh, yeah, you could check that. Yeah, you could check that. Uh, I, and I was thinking of a panel as a pan, as, as a panel, not as a panel zone. So let's be clear: this is not the. This is you wouldn't check this um, for the web panel zone check that's given in J410. Uh, this this is not that type of connection. This is not a beam to column moment connection. So the, the the proper way to check this is to check it the way I've done it, is to check it using equation G2. Um, there is, there is an, there, there's another check, and I believe it's section J42, uh, that, that J4 covers elements of members and connecting elements, and there is a shear check in there that has a C factor of 1.0 and does not have the C sub V factor. And so you could use that equation if you wanted to because you basically get the same equation that you would get out of G2. The danger with that is that if you have a, a beam that doesn't satisfy the H over T sub W requirement that's given in G21, you would miss that limit if you use J42. And so I would strongly encourage you that, to not use that. The proper way to check shear here, uh, and, 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 and even within the connection region, which is referred to as a panel, the proper way to do that is to determine what is the shear within the connection region and check the beam, the beam shear strength, because this is a through member shear that we're dealing with here. Okay. Thank you. Um, someone asked if we could uh, just put slide 81 up again. I'm going to go ahead and do that um, just to catch that that 0 0.3 factor. Thank you. And my apologies, my apologies, uh, folks. Um, also remember that the 0 0.3 factor is missing on slide 80. Also. Okay, uh, there's a couple questions in regard to axial load in the beam. Um, why was axial load not considered in the design of the beam? And a similar question, do you also have to check interaction with beam bending plus axial load? Okay, that, that's a, that's a, that is a great question. It's a complicated question. Um, and and I'm gonna, you, you, Brent, you're going to have to, Brent and the folks participating here, you're going to have to hear me out here. You're going to have to give me a couple, a few minutes here to address this properly. Um, if anybody's seen my my uh, my live presentation on this stuff, you'll see that I address the the axial load issue uh, in, in the beginning. I did not address that here in regard to to this because it was really about the connections. And I wanted to really talk about the, the chevron effect. The chevron effect is this uh, non-zero summation of vertical components of the brace forces. 
but we do have the axial load that need, we need to be we need to consider. And, and here is the issue with the axial load: is the axial load uh, can be taken all out to the axial load basically is going to be the summation of the horizontal components of the brace forces, and you can take all that load to one end of the connection and take it through the beam to column connection in the steel. Or you can take it all to the other end. Or you could take some to one end and some to the other end. Uh, and then there's another option that, that most uh, engineers of record uh, respond to me with when I write the uh, RFI on every Chevron system that we design, that we, where we do this connection design. The common response is, the load never gets to the end of the connection because we're dumping it into the diaphragm. And that's fine. It's, it's, that's not for me to question. Uh, no one knows the structure better than the person who designed it. Um, and so that answer is sufficient for me. Um, so if you're doing that, then you need to, you need to consider you know, how, how, long, how long of a transfer length do you need? How much of this beam is actually in compression? Uh, and, and then you have to you have to make an engineering judgment on how you're going to evaluate this. Is it a beam? Is it a beam column? What is it? If you're taking all the load, if you're going to keep the load in the steel, which is makes sense to me. I mean, if the load's in the brace, then the load's the load's in the steel. Why dump it back out of the diaphragm? Why not just keep it in the steel? Uh, but that's a conversation for another day. But if you are taking the loads out to the beam end connections to where they transfer to the columns, uh, then you need to think about the, the fact that there's this axial load in the beam. And so now you do have this bending and axial load interaction, and you would have to use chapter H, uh, probably H.1, uh, to evaluate the, um, the available strength of that, uh, of that member. Whether you want to look at the moment demand that's on it and calculate what the available, what the, what the reserve axial strength is, or, or do it the other way around. But yes, it needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I did not address that in this webinar. Um, quite honestly, I could do a two-part webinar just on that one, just on that one uh, subject. Um, so yes, absolutely, you need to take that into consideration. Uh, so, and okay. My, my apologies if that if that if that response uh, was uh, much longer than what it needed to be. Not a problem at all, Pat. I'm going to go to slide 95. Uh, the question is: Would the moment demand on the beam be reduced if the combined if a combined gusset was used in lieu of the two-shaped gussets? Uh, that is, a, that is a, a very interesting question, um, and so I would. And the answer, the, the simple answer to that is uh, yes, no, possibly. So, <laughs> so let's uh, let's take a look at the, if we could go to. Uh, can I can I move can I move the slide? Yep. Brent? So let's take a look at this uh, loading diagram here. Looking at this loading diagram, um, you would not know whether there was a combined gusset acting on this beam or individual gussets. Now, someone who is who does this a lot. Um, might say, uh, well, I think I can tell the difference because if it was a combined gusset, uh, the horizontal forces acting at point A and point B would be equal because we take the summation of normal uh, of shear forces and put half on the uh, on on the left half of the gusset and half on the right uh, right half of the gusset. The moment is converted to an equivalent normal force just the way we always do. Um, but what we do is we put the couple of that moment and put the forces associated with that couple on point A and point B if it's a combined gusset. 
And so just because of the numbers or the magnitudes, you can you can sort of tell if you if you're if you do this a lot, you could probably make a pretty good educated guess of whether they were individual or combined. Um, and so because of that, um, it really depends on the magnitudes and the geometry. Um, I've run through, uh, without exaggerating, I don't know, dozens of scenarios evaluating this very question uh, myself, and have found that in certain cases, uh, it, and, and this is empirical, I have not derived a, a first principle equation that proved it one way or another. I've just done test cases. And have found that in some cases uh, there, there, there's really no difference in regard to the demand on the beam. In some cases, uh, the combined gusset was uh, actually a little more de uh, little more damning, and in some cases, the uh, the individual gussets were a little more damning. So it's something that needs that, that if you wanted to consider that, um, you'd have to do that on a case by case basis. Okay. Uh, Next question. Um, in this webinar, you talked about a fold, the fold line of a 2T as a straight line perpendicular to the gussets. Yes. Um, there is an elliptical shaped fold line out there um, that came out of the University of Washington. Is there any reference examples using that elliptical fold line in the AISC seismic design manual? All right. So, um, so. Uh, Charles Roeder from the University of Washington has done some work over the last several years working on something called an elliptical yield line. Uh, and that work was done primarily for uh, corner gussets. Uh, and, regard, and, and we did put, a, we put a, an example problem in the seismic design manual that uses an elliptical yield line. Um, my apologies. I don't remember which example that is, but if my recollection is, it's either F310 or F311. Uh, but, but look through the, the, the second edition SDM. There is an example problem of how to do, use an elliptical yield line um, in a corner gusset. Yeah, yeah Pat, that, that's example 5.3.11. Ah, I got a good memory. Yeah. All right, there you go. Thank you. And a uh, follow-up question, is it, do you believe there's a cost savings in using that elliptical fold line? Oh, boy. Um, well, all I can tell you is what I think. Uh, Bill and I, uh, uh, myself and a guy by the name of Bill Thornton wrote a paper um, I don't know, it was published a couple of years ago in, in that regard. And we compared um, uh, linear, we had compared these linear fold lines to elliptical yield lines and also a, a concept of something called a hinge plate gusset, which is also an example problem in the SDM. And in that, uh, we, um, we basically concluded that um, if we wanted to use a linear fold line and say use a 10 degree spread, uh, on a um, uh, for your Whitmore, uh, that would make the connection very compact, and probably we could get it just as compact, if not more compact, than using the the, uh, the elliptical yield line. Another option, which is which we we uh, I've had all of my all of my estimators um, esti estimate independently, and I've taken the average. If you use the hinge plate concept. Uh, that is shown in the seismic design manual, you can get them even more compact. And so I, I have to say that um, I, I, I do not believe, um, well, I, it's more than believe, I kind of know that using an elliptical yield line uh, is, not, uh, is not any more cost effective uh, than being creative with, uh, uh, with your connection geometry using a linear yield line. And I, I'll follow that up with the stuff that Charles did uh, was was really cool. I mean, it was it, it was really cool stuff. So I'm not saying you know I, I think it's great stuff. Absolutely, it's an option. Take a look at it. 
but in regard to economy, I don't think it. Real, I don't think it's. I don't think it. Uh, it does anything for you. Okay. And um, another seismic question: After a seismic event, would you be expected to be re replacing? Excuse me, replacing all of these braces. Um, I would hope so. Um, if if we had a co if if a structure was subjected to a code level event, and the building was designed um, using the recommendations and prescriptions that we have in place currently, I would hope that the braces would be spaghetti uh, after that event, um, because that's actually what we want. These braces are the key elements. They're, they're what we are using uh, to to dissipate the input energy from the ground motion, uh, and we're expecting uh, that these braces go highly inelastic. If you look at the lead-in to the special concentrically brace frame system in 341, um, it specifically identifies that we expect significant inelastic deformations in the system and identifies the brace as being the member that we expect that inelastic deformation to be accommodated. So I would I would hope that we would have to replace the braces after event after an event, yes. Okay. We're about out of time. Um, but uh, we'll try to get through a couple more questions. Can can we use the sum of the vertical components of the braces? And use it as a point load in our beam check. Um, okay, I can I can get into a bunch of stuff there. So I'll just take the question just as as it's put. Um, if in your model, if you wanted to sort of like remove your braces and uh, and and, and, and replace those with, with the effects of this mechanistic analysis, if you could find some way to keep that stable and do that, that is going to get you very close, very close to what, um, what you'd find uh, compared to the, the, the procedure that I showed you here today. It would get you close. The connection provides some noise. Uh, and sometimes it provides enough noise um, that puts you just over the edge. In other words, that, the, the noise was just enough to make you go up one more beam size relative to that point load or resultant loads acting at the work point analysis does. Uh, so my answer is that that would get you very, very close. All right. Thank you, Pat. Um, we are out of time. We do have a few other questions that we didn't get to. We'll uh, be sure to follow up with those uh, individuals with answers. So my thanks again to Pat Fortney. Thank you, Pat, for a great uh, series on the Chevron Brace Connections. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone who participated. Once again, I want to go through the uh, certificate procedure so that you may uh, receive certificates for you and everyone at your connection. Um, look for an email from AISC. Uh, it's coming from registration at AISC.org. Uh, that will have a link to an online attendance form. And to access that, you're going to use your AISC website username and password. Um, just to reiterate, you had to fill out attendance for uh, Part 1, which was last week, and you'll do a new one this week for Part 2. So if any of you for some reason did not receive that, uh, link for part one, let us know. We'll make sure that you get it so that you can report attendance for both sessions if you did in fact attend both sessions. So again, look for that within two business days. Lastly, just want to let you know about uh, other upcoming events. We do start a new night school course on April 27th. Uh, this is on composite floor systems. That will be presented by Dr. Sam Easterling, Will Jacobs and Dr. Tom Murray it will cover uh, many subjects in regards to composite floor systems. And hopefully you'll join us for that. That's an eight session course on Monday evenings. And certainly look forward to you uh, joining us. Again, class starts on April 27th. 
My thanks again to Pat Fortney for this lecture, and I want to thank you all for uh, joining us and your interest in our programs. We take your feedback seriously, and we appreciate it if you take a moment to fill out the survey that's going to pop up on your screen at the conclusion today. Thanks again, everybody, and have a great afternoon.